results that were significantly different than chance. So the, these are, for those of you who know about statistics, these are z-scores. So about uh, eight years ago now, I decided to bite the bullet and say, well, look, we, we know that the double slit experiment is the primary way of demonstrating the wave particle duality of light. And we can do an experiment where we ask people to make believe that their mind could act as a detector in this system, but at a distance. So people are simply asked to imagine that they could see the photons go through the double slit. And if the mind acts as a detector, then it will collapse the wave function and we will get particles. That's, that's what we will see the behavior as particles. Otherwise, if the mind can't do that, you would get waves. You'd get an interference pattern. So that's the nature of this experiment. There I am working on the system itself. That's what it looks like when it's assembled. This is the camera. It's a 3,000 pixel line camera to measure the interference pattern. Uh, the double slit slide is inside this little holder. The, each slit is 10 microns, and they're 200 microns apart. So they're really, really tiny slits. And so when I ask people to imagine that you could put your mind in the vicinity of the slit and see photons go through the slits one at a time, people say, I can't do that. I can't imagine it. And I would say, well, just imagine you could shrink yourself down to about the size of a micron or smaller and slow time down in your imagination and imagine that you could see the photons go through the slits. So if people can't do that, then they can't do the experiment. So we did many pilot tests, uh, and the bottom line is there. So this dot here, uh, the, the zero line here, is what you'd expect by chance. And it's way below chance, statistically speaking. Uh, it turns out that meditators do much, much better than non-meditators. And the reason why we keep track of whether people are meditators or not is because the task involves focused attention. And meditation is all about attention training. So we figured that people who have attention training should be able to do the task better than those who do not, and that is indeed what we find. So strong statistical evidence that when you ask people to do this rather simple task, that the double slit device behaves differently. The particle, they, they we're seeing particle behavior rather than waves. And when no one is asked to observe the system, it behaves like chance. So that, and we then did a, a formal experiment where we selected people who appeared to do well in the first ex experiment and did ran them again through the experiment and we got even stronger results as compared to a control. So then we just said, since we're dealing with non-local effects, the quantum world, things are connected with far distances, not only through space, but through time as well. Why don't we do an experiment over the internet where we have a double slit system set up, but people can access the, the experiment over the internet and do the same task and see that way we can see whether distance makes a difference. So there's the, the setup, and there's two conditions that you would do in this experiment. You either get a blank screen where you're not observing anything, or you get a screen where you're seeing a squiggly line, and the squiggly line is giving you immediate real-time feedback from the double slit itself. And the task is to make the line go up. If the line goes up, it is designed in software to reflect that the wave function is collapsing. That we're seeing more particles than waves. We also had a Linux box programmed to simulate a human. And the reason you do this is you want to make sure that if you get results in this experiment that it wasn't an accident, it wasn't an artifact, it wasn't something wrong with the equipment and so on. So we had a Linux box observing and doing the same thing as humans. And of course the nice thing about that is that the, uh, the double slit system and the server that's sending bits out over the internet, it doesn't know if there's a human on the other end or a Linux box. And we're assuming that Linux boxes are not conscious. Uh, maybe the WAS would think that it was conscious, but probably not. So what the camera sees is an interference pattern. It looks like that. That's what the camera sees. And we're measuring something called fringe visibility, which is how sharp these fringes are. And it's a very simple equation looking at the peak and the trough of adjacent fringes. And so the prediction is that when we're, people are seeing the screen that gives feedback of the system, that the fringes will shrink. And this is, this is where the idea of collapsing the wave function comes from. You're collapsing the wave-like character of, of um, the quantum. So we predict uh, there will be a collapse of interference. This is the result of uh, all data collected in 2013. So when people are observing the 20 fringes that we measured all collapsed 
and very significantly so as compared to when the Linux box was looking and there was no collapse at all. So the nice thing about this as well is not only did we get a confirmation of what we saw in the laboratory, but we're able to test does distance matter? And so our laboratory is in California, and the, as, the farthest away you can get from our lab is South Africa, and it's 18,000 kilometers. And we're able to look at all of the, the dots here are individual trials in the experiment, somebody doing the experiment from some distance away. And the question is, is the slope of the line that goes through this different than zero? Because if the slope of the line is different than zero, then we're dealing with something like an electromagnetic force or some kind of force which would decline with distance. But the slope of the line here is zero to six decimal places. So we know that there's no difference. People in South Africa were getting the same result as people a kilometer away from our laboratory. So again, suggesting this really is a quantum effect. The observer effect is independent of distance. So we published this in a physics journal in 2012 and 13, and they have a couple of additional articles coming along. And I'm doing that to uh, inform the physics community that is still struggling with this basic problem of interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, that actually there are experiments that can be done, and we're doing, uh, that address the question. Does the observer make a, dis a difference or not? The answer is yes, it does. So then we, uh, some of our colleagues said, well, how do you know that it's really a quantum effect? Because after all, you're using a laser system, continual laser, continuous output, with trillions of photons per second. And that means that maybe it's quantum and maybe it's not. So we decided to do the same experiment using a single photon at a time. So it's a single quanta, one photon in the system at a time, and do the same kind of experiment as we did before. You can show uh, through this system that it really is operating in the quantum way, that you're getting interference even though one photon at a time is going through it. And you give it somebody a task where they're going to observe the system with their mind alone and if, that, if it collapses the wave function, then interference will go away. And in this particular configuration, the trough will go up. We can gently just observe which slit it goes through. So you put a detector just above the upper slit that will flash or beep whenever it sees an atom go through that top slit. Sure enough, you fire the atoms through one at a time 50% of the time, the detector will beep. The other 50% of the time, it doesn't, the assumption being that the atom has gone through the lower slit. But of course, I've been cheeky here. I haven't shown you the results of the experiment. That's what you get. 50% of the time, it beeps, and you see a spot arrive adjacent to the upper slit. The other half of the time, it doesn't beep, but you see a spot arrive at the lower slit. So, yeah, it's picked out the atoms that have gone through the upper slit and not the ones that have gone through. So each atom does go through one slit or the other. But that's a different result to what we had earlier. So here's the last bit of sneakiness that we can play with atoms. Surely now, you know, we're, we're going to get to grips with it. Leave the detector there but just very quietly go and unplug it. <laughs> Don't let the atoms know that you're not spying on them. <laughs> Make them think that you're still detecting them. So, yeah, 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 okay, we're going to run the experiment. Atoms, okay, get ready, one at a time. We're going to be checking on you. All right, so run the experiment again. <laughs> 